Well, it was around this time of year, uh, possibly almost 17 years ago now, and that I became a Christian. I realized the bad news and that my sin and my rebellion against God was going to sink me down to hell. But I also understood the good news that Jesus Christ himself had made a full payment for that sin and through faith in him, I could be saved. That's what I did. I trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. It was the best day of my life. Uh, Shortly after this, I began attending a large Pentecostal church in my local town, and it could have been fairly described as a happy, clappy church. They were very happy, and there was lots of clapping there also. And for all its problems and theological messiness, to this day, I remain impressed by the spirit of prayer which was found among the members of that Pentecostal church, and the seriousness with which they sought to call upon God. Now, if you were a betting person, which I wouldn't recommend, you could have bet all the money you had, all the money you owned, that during the course of one of these prayer meetings, you would hear somebody quote with vigor and passion, the way that only a Pentecostal person could, Ephesians chapter 6, And verse 12, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. It's a verse you would always hear quoted in Pentecostal circles. And upon hearing it, I thought, well, that sounds awfully impressive, but what does it mean? What are these principalities and powers? What are these spiritual forces of evil at work behind the scenes? And what does that mean for me as a Christian here today? Well, as we approach our passage here in Revelation 12, those questions are given a scriptural answer. In our passage, we're given a glimpse behind the veil We get to peek behind the curtain of the natural world and see what is going on behind the scenes. In Revelation 12, you see up close and personal the war which rages between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. You get to see played out in technicolor everything that God had promised all the way back in Genesis chapter 3 as the drama of redemption unfolds. Let me just bring you back for a moment into the Garden of Eden to remind you what happened and when this war, in one sense, started. Adam was the priest of the Garden of Eden. He was called to tend and guard guard this garden paradise from evil. But sadly, he failed to protect his wife from the serpent as God had instructed him to do. And this serpent, through his craft and through his malice, through his deceitfulness, tricked Eve into disobedience. And Adam followed her into the sin, eyes wide open, plunging the world into sin and death and bringing upon the earth a terrible curse. But because God is a God of grace and compassion, the story does not end there. Though there will be severe consequences for this disobedience, God is going to make a way to undo the evil which Satan has sought to bring about in this world. God is not finished with his people. And he gives them a set of amazing promises in Genesis 3, verses 14 to 15. We read these words. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust all days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. And that day in the garden, a war began between Satan and God. And there is now in this world, just as God promised, an enmity, a clashing between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. Another way of saying that is that there will be a continual struggle between the children of God and the children of the devil. It looks at times like God's people are going to be overcome, but the outcome is secure. 
The serpent cannot ever win. There is one who comes, born of the seed of the woman, who will crush the serpent's head, saving his people at great personal cost to himself. And of course, we know now in these New Testament times that that person is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ, the one that Scripture presents as King of kings and Lord of lords. He is the one who will crush the head of the serpent and win the day for his people. And this war between Christ and the devil, it's so important to the whole meta-narrative of Scripture, the big story. And scholar Sinclair Ferguson said that the rest of the Bible could be considered a footnote to what happened in Genesis 3. In other words, the rest of Scripture is showing you how this war outworks itself in time and in history. And as we arrive now in Revelation chapter 12, the fulfillment of the prophecy of Genesis is about to, is about to come upon this world. The one born of the seed of the woman, born to crush the serpent's head, is about to arrive, and the dragon is not happy about it one bit. So in order to help us get to grips with what's going on in the passage, um, I have three points which I, I trust will be helpful for us and um, to get to grips with what the passage is saying and what it means for our lives. Uh, firstly, we'll look together at Satan's defeat on earth. And then John kind of zooms out and shows you it from a heavenly perspective. Secondly, we'll see Satan's defeat in heaven. And then thirdly, we'll see that despite all this happening, Thirdly, we'll see Satan's refusal to give up seeking to hurt Christ and his people. So let's look together firstly at Satan's defeat on earth. Satan's defeat on earth. Well, as we arrive in chapter 12 of the book of Revelation, it's as if John has pressed pause on the video player. Did you ever have one of those? He presses pause on the video player, he zooms out and he's giving you a big picture of what is going on behind the scenes of our world. There is a dragon, he wages war against God's people but his days are numbered. He will suffer a terrible defeat and humiliation and therefore the church can have hope even in the midst of persecution and discouragement. And that really is the big point not only of Revelation 12 but of the whole book. So if we get a bit lost in the details this morning, that's the big picture God wants you to see. These things are written for our help, encouragement, and perseverance in the faith. So what does John see first? Verse 1, he sees a woman. Verse 1, and a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars. And just to add another layer of difficulty... To understand then this, who this is, we're told in verse 2, she was pregnant and was crying out in birth pains and the agony of giving birth. And if we're going to get the rest of the interpretation of the passage correct, it means that we have to identify who this woman is. Now many Roman Catholic scholars would tell you that this is Mary, the mother of Jesus. And she's often referred to in the Roman church as the queen of heaven. And it's easy to see how they came to this conclusion, isn't it? Verse 5 tells us that the woman is pregnant with Messiah. Verse 5, she gives birth to a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. And that's actually a quote from Psalm 2 and verse 8 about the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who will rule the nations or shepherd the nations with an iron rod. So the Roman Catholics argue, she gives birth to Christ, it must be Mary, um, case closed. But let me suggest to you that that's not the best interpretation of this passage. That's not the best way to handle these apocalyptic writings. If you'd understand the symbols in Scripture, present in any portion of Scripture, you should always ask yourself the question, have we seen these things before in the Old Testament? Is there any place which sheds light on what they might mean and what, how we could interpret them? So take, for example, the woman. She has the sun, the moon, the 12 stars. Have we seen this before in Scripture? And of course, the answer is yes, we have. Cast your minds back to Joseph 
in Genesis 37. He's having these dreams and he gleefully tells his brothers in Genesis 37, Behold, I have dreamed another dream. Behold, the sun, the moon, and the eleven stars were bowing down to me. But when he told it to his father and to his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come and bow ourselves to the ground before you? So the twelve stars were a picture of Israel. And we know that Joseph's dream was true because it came to pass as his brothers bowed before him in Egypt. That was a picture of Israel and so it is with the woman of Revelation 12. She's a picture of Israel, the covenant people of God. There's further evidence of this because she's described as a woman who's crying out in birth pains. And that again is a frequent Old Testament image of Israel. Isaiah 26, 17, like a pregnant woman who writhes and cries out in her pangs when she is near to giving birth, so will we because of you, O Lord. Isaiah 55 speaks of the woman as being barren, but she will give birth to more children than the barren woman. And Micah 5, 3 says that Israel will be handed over to their enemies until the time when the woman in labor gives birth. It's a frequent Old Testament picture of Israel. So using scripture to interpret the scripture, we can see that this woman is God's covenant people, Israel. And as we saw in verse 5, from Israel comes Messiah. It has been their hope, it has been their prayer, and they have travailed longing for the appearance of the man-child of verse 5. And here in Revelation 12, he is about to come forth. Jesus Christ, the hope of Israel, the seed of the woman, born of a virgin, born under law. He is about to come and, and to complete his work of redemption. And like any birth of a child, it's, it's usually a joyous occasion, isn't it? You know, when someone has a child, we all celebrate together. But here in Revelation 12, not everyone is happy about the birth of this child. One person in particular is absolutely furious. We see that in verses 3 and 4. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and on his head seven diadems. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and threw them down to the earth. As the woman labors, crying out, seeking to bring forth her child, a terrible creature emerges. He is wise and cunning, symbolized by the seven heads he possesses. He has been given authority, symbolized by the ten heads and ten horns he has. And he has been crowned by those who he seeks to rule over. It is he, we are told in verse 4, who swept down a third of the stars of heaven. Speaking of the angels, when Satan rebelled in heaven above. Those whom Jude describes as not keeping their proper place. And just in case we're in any doubt as to who this red dragon is, verse 9 explains it clearly. It is, as verse 9 tells us, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. And verse 4, it shows you what kind of a welcome Satan has planned for this new baby being delivered into the world. Verse 4, and the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so, so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. Now the image is absolutely grotesque, isn't it? Here's the woman in a place of vulnerability and pain, and there's the dragon poised at the business end of things, ready to devour the child as soon as he is able. It reminds me a little bit of the ravens um, in the fields in the UK. As the uh, lambs are born, you know, coming out of their mother, the ravens descend and peck out their eyes and eat their tongues as they have been born. It's a horrible picture, and that's why people shoot a lot of ravens in the UK. And the image is the same here. It's grotesque, it's disgusting, and John wants you to feel that that is the curse. A disgusting image has been used because Satan is a disgusting creature. 
He is, as Jesus himself said, a murderer from the beginning. And he has a modus operandi. He has an M.O. of how he likes to get his dirty business done. And it always involves the death of children. It was here whispered into the heart of Cain, right back in the beginning, to murder his brother Abel, fearing that one of the descendants could become the head crusher. When Moses was born, Satan again, sensing that there was a disturbance in the spiritual realm, he put it into the heart of Pharaoh to kill all the firstborn sons of Egypt, fearing again that the seed of the woman was drawing near. And as Christ is born into the world, he is there ready to kill again. You might remember in Matthew's gospel account, when Herod heard from the wise men that a new king had been born in Bethlehem. Again, children were destroyed. And as a very brief aside, friends, we can be sure that Satan has his people here in the New Zealand government. When thousands of children are put to death every year, you can be sure that Satan's claws are in to our government. But here in our passage, despite all Satan's desires and plans, Christ proved to be one child whom Satan did not manage to sink his teeth into. Despite all his malice and planning to try and get rid of Jesus, she gave birth to a male child, one who is to rule the nations with a rod of iron. The son of promise had arrived, and never had there been before such an affront to the kingdom of darkness. He has come into our world, as John says, to destroy the works of the devil. And because Satan knows this, he tried all throughout Jesus' life to destroy him. It was Satan, wasn't it, who met Jesus in the wilderness and said, throw yourself from the top of the temple, the angels will catch you, trying to tempt Christ to kill himself. It was Satan who put it into the heart of the chief priests, scribes and Pharisees to put Jesus to death. And it was Satan who whispered into the heart of Judas Iscariot to betray the one that he had called Master. And Satan thought that he'd got what he wanted. As Jesus carried his cross towards Golgotha, Satan thought that he had achieved what he had planned all those years ago. As Christ died on the cross, he thought, I've won the battle. The seed of the woman seems to be no more. But behind the cross, behind what it looked like was happening, behind this apparent tragedy, God was showing his own wisdom and power. Paul tells us that there was a plan being executed that Satan knew, he didn't know anything about it. He said it was the wisdom of God which God decreed before the ages for our glory. It was a wisdom which none of the the rulers of this age understood. If they had understood it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. In seeking to instigate the death of the Son of God, Satan actually destroys his own power. As Christ dies on the cross, he became our sin offering. He who knew no sin became sin for us, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And so in Satan's planning to get rid of the seed of the woman, to get rid of Christ, he brings God's mercy nearer than ever before. As the writer to the Hebrews puts it, Christ died in order that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil. Far from being the final solution Satan had planned for, it was his own kingdom which took a devastating blow at the cross. After dying for our sins, Christ rose again bodily, giving many convincing proofs to over 500 people at one time and his disciples that he was alive. After leaving his disciples with a great commission, the promise of the Spirit, something else happened which meant that Satan would be even more furious. Verse 5 tells us this. It says, The child was caught up to God and to his throne. Now this is a clear reference to Christ's ascension. That Christ, having been resurrected from the dead, returned back to his father to be crowned king of the nations. Just as we confessed in the creed this morning, he ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the father. He will 
come again with glory. It was this vision that Daniel saw all those years ago in Daniel chapter 7. I'll read it to you. Daniel said this, In my vision at at night I I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and people of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. And so Daniel saw Christ approaching the Father and being given the name that is above every name. And this is bad news for Satan. He is a created being. And as Christ ascends to heaven, Satan is no longer able to seek him out and try and destroy him. He sits as king of kings and lord of lords. And he's no no longer constricted by the confines of space and time. And so consequently, he's no longer in the reach of the, the devil and his schemes. And because Christ has ascended, his people are protected too. Have a look in verse 6. He sees that he can't get Christ, so he turns to the woman. And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared by God, in which she had nourished for 1,260 days. And the point is this. Even though Christ is not physically present, his people are still under his watchful care and protection. Even though he is in heaven, he is still present with us, by his Holy Spirit. And so as we take a step back, we see Satan's inability to destroy Christ. And it reminds us that God's purposes always prevail. He is in control of all things and no one in the heaven above or the earth beneath is able to stand against them. And just as God is able to preserve Christ, so he will preserve his people also. So that's something of Satan's defeat on earth, and it's one way we can understand this passage. But now John's attention is moved above. He wants to see what the implications are of this cosmic conflict from a heavenly perspective. And this leads us to our second point. We've seen Satan's defeat on earth. Now let's look together, secondly, at Satan's defeat in heaven. Satan's defeat in heaven. Well, now that Jesus, in the words of Colossians 2, has disarmed the powers and authorities, he's made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. What does this victory look like in heaven? Well, verse 7 to 9 show you the amazing scene, which I believe takes place after Christ's ascension. Satan, enraged at what happens, seeks to make war with God himself. This is verses 7 to 9. Now war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, the ancient serpent, who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. Now, I don't think this event here is to be confused with the original fall of Satan. With that fall that the prophet Isaiah speaks of and the prophet Ezekiel. The fall which happened because of Lucifer's pride. The fall in which it was said, How you have fallen, O Lucifer, son of the morning, you who were in the heavens. I don't think this is that same event, and I'll explain to you why that is. You see, before the cross... It's obvious that Satan was the bad guy, right? (laughs) He's in the garden, he's tempting Adam away, but he still seems to have some access to heaven to accuse God's people. You see it in the book of Job, don't you? It says, does Job fear God for nothing? Strike his body, strike him, and you'll see that he's a hypocrite. You'll see that he's false. There he is accusing, tempting, speaking his lies about God's people. You see in the book of Zechariah when Joshua the high priest was there and Satan appears before God to accuse him and says, he's filthy, he's disgusting. How can you have fellowship with a man like this? 
But God says, I've clothed him in righteousness, and you cannot accuse him, Satan. And so Satan still had some access before the cross into heaven to accuse God's people. But the picture we're given here in Revelation is that he was utterly cast out and not allowed to return. There was no longer, verse 8, any place for them in heaven. Because of what Christ has done, Satan can no longer accuse God's people. And because of this, well, there's great rejoicing. Have a look in verse 10. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ has come. Obviously speaking about when Jesus ascended. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. A change of circumstance has happened after the cross. Satan does not have a leg to stand on in heaven's court any longer. You might imagine him in heaven, speaking to God, saying, God, how can you be friends with a man like Abraham? He's a liar, he's a coward, he's a hypocrite, and you call him the friend of God? Are you a just God? Or again, Satan could have said, how can you call David a man after your own heart? He's an adulterer, a man of blood, and this is the man you have fellowship with? How can you forgive Israel again and again, though they worship false gods and create idols ad nauseum? How is any of this possible for you, God? I think that you're unjust. You can imagine the devil speaking this way. But through the cross, an answer has been found to all those accusations. He has taken the punishment in full for our sins. He's removed them as far as the east is from the West. And now truly there is no more condemnation for those who are in Christ. Satan can no longer point the finger at God or his people in those heavenly rooms because Christ has made full payment. So if Satan were here this morning and he sought to accuse me to God, he wouldn't have a leg to stand on. God would say, yes, it's all true. Luke is a sinner. But all those sins have been paid for. They've been put away by the blood of my son and I have no more anger against him. Because of what Christ has done, we've been put into a wonderful position. That's why we can sing hymns like Before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. He pleads for us Christians in heaven. His blood speaks a better word than the blood of Abel, and Satan cannot even turn up to accuse us anymore. This is made clear in verse 11, the victory which God's people have over Satan. Verse 11, and they conquered him, that is Satan, by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they love not their lives even to death. And notice that the saints don't conquer Satan by being good people or by doing a lot of good and religious deeds. It is the blood of the Lamb which has made them conquer. It is their trust in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ which helps them overcome the world, the flesh, and the devil. It is the word of testimony, not their personal testimony, but the word of the gospel testimony, which has been given to them through Jesus Christ, which helps them overcome all the lies of Satan. They are a people triumphant because they are looking to Christ, trusting in him. And Paul spells out the implications for you of this in Romans 8. He says, because of this, who can lay any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is there to condemn? If God justifies us, who can ever speak a word against us? If God is for us, who can be against us? This is good news for every Christian. If we're honest, we're often quick to condemn ourselves. Sometimes, sadly, we're quick to condemn one another. But Jesus Christ does not condemn you this morning if you are a Christian. He gives you that promise that your sins and lawless deeds, he will remember them no more. It is finished. So through the gospel, Satan is cast out. The saints are secure. There's no more condemnation. He's lost his right to speak against us. 
at this stage, we could almost just finish the sermon, couldn't we, and um, go off on our way rejoicing. You know, the movie, the credits could fall down, the cheesy music could start, and we could happily walk off into the sunset. Uh, But unfortunately, that's not where the passage ends. Although Satan is a defeated foe, he's not willing to accept his defeat gracefully. So we've seen something of Satan's defeat on earth. We've seen his defeat in heaven. Now let's look thirdly and finally at Satan's refusal to give up seeking to hurt Christ and his people. Well, while the vanquishing of Satan from heaven, it meant good news for those guys up there, for those who live on the earth, the casting down of Satan means a whole new series of challenges. You see that in verse 12. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath, because he knows that his time is short. He knows that his time is short. Now, it's a well-known fact in nature that in the wild, in the bush, the most dangerous animal you can come across is a wounded animal. It will attack without even thinking. And so it is with Satan. He has received a mortal wound through the cross, and now he is on the attack. He knows that judgment will come upon him. He knows, as Paul tells us in Romans, that the God of peace will soon crush Satan under his feet. He knows that his final resting place is in the lake of fire. And so because of this, he wants to inflict as much damage on Christ's kingdom, upon Christ's people, as he can. You see where he he, he directs his attention in verse 13. And when the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. And now it's broadened out. It's not just the old covenant people of God. It's the full covenant people. It's her children also. Verse 17. Then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. So the picture John sees is Satan raging against the entirety of God's people People like a wounded and rabid animal. Each one who is a believer in Christ, whether they're Jew or Gentile, there's only one covenant of grace from creation. And if you're in that covenant, if you have faith in Christ, you have an enemy in the dragon. He hates anyone who would seek to worship and follow the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we might ask the question, what's going to happen to God's people now? It was all right when Jesus Christ walked the earth. He just drove out the demons with a word. But now he's in heaven. Will God's people become a a meal for the dragon? Well, our passage says, far from it. Verse 14 shows us the special protection that Christ's people have against the raging dragon, even when Christ is not physically present. Satan seeks to attack the woman and her offspring, but verse 14, the woman was given two wings of the great eagle so that she might fly from the serpent into the wilderness, to the place where she is to be nourished for a time and times and half a time. And the point of that vision is this. In the midst of the woman's struggle, in the midst of the struggle of the covenant people of God with this enemy, divine help will be given by the Lord himself. And this help will be given for, as it says in the text, three and a half years, or a time and times, times half a time. Now, 3.5 years, 42 months, 1,260 days, these are all the same thing. And these are symbolic numbers, which um, signal that God will look after his people through the entire time of their tribulation and persecution. And I don't think we need to look into the future for a special seven-year tribulation period. And John says at the start of the letter, he says, here am I, John, your partner in the tribulation. He was speaking to the first century church. He said, we're partners together in the tribulation. In the time from when Christ ascended to the time when he returns, there will always be trouble for the people of God. There will always be an enemy who seeks to destroy. 
So this is what it's, it's signified by the three and a half years, that whole time in which the church is persecuted. So, uh, Jesus will be there and he will keep his church from ultimate harm. So the serpent gets even more angry. He pulls out all the stops in verse, verse 15. The serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman to sweep her away with a flood. Well, it sounds like the woman's going to be finished, doesn't it? It sounds like he's finally caught up to her. But verse 16, but the earth came to the help of the woman and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed the river that the dragon had poured from his mouth. Satan tries hard to destroy God's people, but his power is, is small, it is limited. He is not as powerful as the Lord Jesus Christ. The scriptures say, greater is he that is in you than he who is in the world. You see, Satan has a very short memory, doesn't he? He has forgotten that God has promised the final perseverance of his people. They will persevere to the end. It's not because they're more clever than Satan and his forces, but it's because the Lord's hand is strong to serve. He will ensure that everyone for whom he died and has put their trust in him will arrive safely in the new Jerusalem no matter what Satan seeks to throw at them. Even the very earth itself is upheld by the word of Christ's power. This is a picture of absolute sovereignty and control on the part of Christ. He will use whatever means necessary to save his own people. They are, as Zechariah puts it, brands plucked from the burning. And Satan cannot and will not be able to derail their faith. Though Satan seeks to sift us as wheat, just as he did Simon Peter, Christ prays for us and he ensures that we will never ever fall from his grace. So this is the picture that scripture presents of our present struggle of where we are right now. Satan goes around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. But the true Christian will not become his dinner. Through his craft, don't get me wrong, Satan can derail a Christian. He can, he can get them off track. He can leave us feeling harassed and helpless. He can, he can make a real mess in a church. But he cannot steal from us our salvation. We have a shepherd who is too strong and too powerful. He gives to us eternal life and no one either in heaven above or earth beneath can snatch us from the shepherd's hands. So there you have it, Revelation 12, a peek behind the curtain of the natural world to show you what really goes on behind the scenes. So let me give you a few thoughts of application as we come to a close this morning. Firstly, and perhaps most fundamentally, you have to ask yourself the question, in this war, whose side are you on? Could you be described this morning as the people described in verse 17, as those who hold to the testimony of Jesus and seek to keep his commandments. Have you believed the gospel message for yourself this morning? If you have, then rejoice. If you believe in Jesus Christ, you are of the seed of the woman. And in your hope in Christ, you will never, ever be put to shame. But if you do not believe the gospel this morning, one picture the scripture presents of those who are unbelievers is that they are of the seed of the serpent. Jesus said to those who didn't believe to him, you are of your father the devil and the lust of your father you will do. So there's only two options. You can't sit on the fence. You have to decide for Christ or for Satan. It's really that simple. But let me encourage you, if you haven't done that yet, if you haven't come to God for his mercy, come to him. He will transfer you from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the son of his love. He will forgive your sins and commit himself to you forever. He calls you to come to him. So here is call this morning if you haven't already come to him. This passage encourages those of us here this morning who are Christians that there is no condemnation. This morning you might be struggling with all kinds of fears and doubts, but the gospel message speaks peace to you, Christian. 
Jesus' work on your behalf is enough to silence all the accusations of the enemy. So let it be enough to silence your conscience, to silence the doubts in your own heart as you look to Jesus Christ. And when you feel tempted to despair and doubt, you're not going to find peace by turning your eyes inwards through some kind of morbid introspection. We spoke about turning our eyes upon Jesus, didn't we? Now, for those of you who are into boats, you know, to steady a ship, it's no good if you get the anchor and you put it inside the ship. It has to be thrown overboard outside of the vessel in order to steady the whole ship. And it's the same with our peace. We must cast all our hope outside of ourselves into the Lord Jesus Christ. It's only as we do that that we're anchored firm in the hope of the gospel, triumphing over certain, not only in eternity, but in this world as well. And finally, friends, we must be encouraged that God will finish the work he has begun in our hearts. And no matter what certain seats to throw of us, the Christian will triumph. There's a wonderful picture of this in The Pilgrim's Progress, one of my favorite books by John Bunyan. Um, he sees a picture, there's a fire burning, and he sees Satan with a bucket of water trying to toss the water onto the fire to put it out. But the more he throws the water on, the higher the fire goes. And Satan's confused, he doesn't understand what's happening. So why is the fire getting larger and larger? Well, it's because out of sight is the Lord Jesus Christ, and he has a vessel of oil pouring it onto the fire to keep the fire burning. It will never go out because he maintains it secretly behind the scenes with the oil of his grace. And that's a wonderful picture for us, isn't it? Though we're in the fire now, as it were, you know, these are days of sorrow for many of us. These are days of hardship. Jesus Christ will keep us until the end. He will keep that fire of faith alive in our hearts. And if you've committed to him, he will commit himself to you. He will keep you until the very, very end. And so my Christian friends, we can trust him now because we have triumphed over Satan uh, by the blood of the Lamb. Amen.